Good morning. Uh, the Subcommittee on Federal Workforce, Postal Service in the District of Columbia will now come to order. I want to thank uh, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton for, for attending. We are waiting for our ranking member. Uh, he is in another meeting. I understand that, but we will begin with the opening statements anyway. The uh, purpose of today's hearing is to examine the distinct challenges faced by female DC code felons in what is being done to ensure their proper progression through the prison system as well as their successful reentry back into society. The chair, the ranking members, and the subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. Uh, hearing no objections, so ordered. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to the subcommittee on the Federal Workforce Postal Service in the District of Columbia oversight hearing entitled Female DC Code Felons Unique Challenges in Prison and at Home. Today's hearing gives the subcommittee the opportunity to examine the distinct challenges commonly faced by female DC code felons, such as regaining custody of their children, maintaining and managing uh, complex social relationships, and generally reintegrating back into society. There are roughly 250 DC code felons scattered up and down, excuse me, 250 female DC code felons scattered up and down the East Coast in various federal prisons. In terms of placement, the Bureau of Prisons generally houses D.C. female inmates at facilities in nine states and the District of Columbia, with the majority residing in Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. There are several issues that arise relating to female D.C. code felons. These challenges range from the ease of access to Bureau of Prisons programs to the difficulty of keeping D.C. code felons connected to their families and community resources. While the subcommittee has previously explored some of these concerns as they pertain to the D.C. male offenders specifically, today's oversight hearing is intended to discuss how these issues impact D.C. female offenders. A female D.C. code felons face a myriad of difficult problems uh, and diff different problems than do their male counterparts. For one, children play a much larger role in the lives of female offenders. Studies have shown incarcerated women exhibit high levels of attachment with their children and are more likely than men to live with their minor children both pre- and post-incarceration. This attachment makes separation from their children among the most damaging aspects of prison life for women. Furthermore, the lack of contact can have a profound negative effect on these women's emotional and psychological state. In light of this finding, the Bureau of Prisons, much to their credit, has taken steps to alleviate some of these drawbacks by offering classes on parenting, managing incarceration, and increased communication. However, these services are not available at all Bureau of Prisons facilities, and certainly not, all, not at all facilities where female DC code felons are housed. After release, poverty plays a large role in many ex-felons' lives. According to a Bureau of Justice Statistics report, 37% of female felons had incomes of less than 600 per month prior to arrest. In addition to economic challenges, many female felons suffer from physical abuse, sexually transmitted disease, and drug abuse. Therefore, it's clear that more needs to be done to ensure the successful reentry of these women. To that end, this hearing seeks to review the ways in which the Bureau of Prisons, the court services, and offender supervision agencies, various local agencies, and community service providers are working collaboratively to address the unique needs of female DC code felons both while imprisoned and after release. I'd like to thank my colleague, Congresswoman Ellen Holmes Norton, for her tireless work in this policy area. The subcommittee looks forward to working with you as we continue to work with various federal agencies tasked with the carrying out of what is traditionally a local governing function. Again, I thank all those in attendance this afternoon, and I look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses. I now yield uh, five minutes to Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I ask that my um, remarks, um, the entirety of my remarks, my written remarks be included in the record in light of uh, new developments that I would like uh, to devote my uh, remarks to. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, your hearings on D.C. felons in the Bureau of Prisons uh, have been exemplary for the results they have produced. This is a particularly important hearing because it is the first hearing since the transfer of D.C. felons uh, to BOP uh, for women. 
they are small in number, but um, important to focus on. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, your hearings alone without additional language have produced uh, very important changes at BOP. For example, um, the district felons now have access to the state of the art uh, program, drug program at the Bureau of Prisons. Um, this is a very important program, not because it is an excellent program, but because it affords early release for those uh, who in fact uh, complete it satisfactorily. In addition, for example, there's a new addition uh, for a drug program at Rivers, the closest of the prisons uh, to the District of Columbia. Now the District, uh, the Bureau of Prisons improved uh, conditions for prisoners when Lorton closed in many ways and BOP does uh, valuable work and has an excellent reputation. There are real advantages uh, to DC residents uh, housed there, but there is a very serious disadvantage and that is the distance from home. We are talking about 5,600 all told DC code felons housed in 115 facilities away from their children and families and ministers and everyone who cares for them with no possibility that they can reach them except by phone if they are able to do so. Now, these 115 facilities are in 33 different states. These prisoners are sent, uh, as their number comes up, it would seem, without regard to where they are from. Uh, in states, prisoners are far more likely to be closer to home and therefore to all important reentry services. But if you are in Alabama or North Dakota, uh, you're not going to get reentry services even though BOP has uh, important services while you are in prison. From the point of view of district residents, the importance of reentry before our residents who are in prison hit the streets has to do with, among other things, recidivism and preparation for a life uh, that uh, is no longer subject uh, to prison. Um, but most of our inmates have no access to what could be called reentry services until they cross the district line with or without housing, uh, uh, having seen their family, having not seen their family sometimes for years. Um, we have not been able to measure the effect this particular distance from home has on recidivism. But nobody in this field would say that there could, there would not be a significant effect with no reentry services available until post prison. Um, the BOP is a federal facility. Congress charged the BOP for the first time with housing state prisoners. The BOP has done well. But with your hearings, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have seen the recasting of some of what BOP has done, such as the drug program, uh, to accommodate these state prisoners. Our greatest challenge now is to make sure this recasting goes the whole distance. We have just learned um, that the BOP has responded in a very significant way on two issues. We were very concerned, Mr. Chairman, that p juveniles convicted as adults were sent as far away as North Dakota. Now, these are children still. And at age 18, they're going into a BOP facility. But these children could be as young as, I believe, 14. So to take these children that far from home to as distant a state as you can find, with no access to their parents, loved ones, or anyone else, is almost to presage what is going to uh, occur to children hardened so early. 
Um, we make no excuses for the terrible crimes they have committed, but we don't need to commit a crime against them in return uh, by not treating them as children in at least some ways while they uh, are still children. Uh, I want to commend uh, Director Lappin uh, and uh, it is, I guess it is Mr. Brown of the uh, D.C. Department of Corrections for a memorandum of understanding that will keep youth who have been convicted as adults in the district jail until these young people are ready to go to the Bureau of Prisons. This is a very important change and I want to personally thank Mr. Lappin even before his testimony. Uh, for his movement in this direction, these came, some of this uh, was discussed at our last hearing. It is a very important result. In addition, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have learned uh, that uh, the Bureau will transfer uh, 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 the first 200 D.C. felons uh, to the custody of the D.C. Department of Corrections 90 days before the expiration of their sentences will send them home in order to allow them to have access to reentry services. I cannot thank the director enough for this change. What this means is that these DC residents will have access to the DC jail um, services which are quite extensive. They include educational programs le leading to the GED. Of course, we have that at BOP. There is drug, there's a drug rehabilitation and residential substance abuse program there. There's HIV counseling and treatment. There's comprehensive medical services uh, using a community uh, model in the jail. There is a reentry unit, a special unit called LINC. There is a job readiness program there is a permanent housing uh, program. There is a uh, uh, connected with the university legal services and FUSE projects. There is a mental health program in conjunction with the Department of Mental Health of the District of Columbia. There is a transgender program and there is a juvenile program. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do want to say that the DC jail, I have always uh, indicated that I thought that the uh, BOP was a particularly um, uh, um, excellent facility. I want to indicate that the DC jail it also is, the DC jail is uh, accredited by the American uh, Correctional Association, the National Commission on Correctional Health Care. Uh, uh, it, it has the largest number of correctional offices who hold the credential of the ACA professional certification program the DC jail has received the exemplary program award of the ACA in, in 2009 and 2008. So I think what we'll have is uh, our uh, residents who are now at BOP transferred from one excellent facility to another 90 days before their true reentry so that they can reenter civil society in the District of Columbia prepared uh, to move forward in a new life. And I thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank the BOP in advance, and of course, I thank the DC jail for its cooperation. I thank the gentlelady. The chair recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and let me first of all uh, thank uh, Representative Norton for introducing this legislation. And while it is specific to the District of Columbia, it really has implications for the entirety of America. And so while we might be talking about the District of Columbia, the policies and practices relate in a big way to the entire country. I also want to commend Director Lappin for his sensitivities as we continue to approach changing environments, changing needs, changing problems, and the reality that this is much more of a problem and an issue that it might have been a decade ago or 20 years ago. And so changes are 
absolutely needed. I also want to commend you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and for the hearings that you've held prior to now. Many people know that I consider the whole question of criminal justice and how we handle it is one of the major problems facing all of America, but especially urban America and especially African American communities where you find the greatest preponderance of individuals who end up being incarcerated. I think that the specifics of looking at female entry, and of course we know that African American women happen to be the fastest growing part of the prison population in America. We also know that notwithstanding the fact that the overall African-American population in the country is probably about 15 percent, but more than 50 percent of all of the individuals who are incarcerated <coughs> in America are African-Americans. And we know that African-American males are off the chart. And so the issues that get raised in this kind of hearing don't, as I indicated, just relate in a real sense to the District of Columbia. The questions that I get from people all the time happens to deal with the issue of how far away their relatives are. And while you wouldn't be as far away uh, <laughs> in a state, <laughs> in the state. <laughs> but that's a question I mean I must get every week <laughs> at least 20, 30 people who want to know if there is some way that they can get their relatives closer to home for any number of reasons. And so I think that as we remove some of the barriers to reentry, and this is the very important part. If we're going to reduce the overall prison population, we are going to have to reduce the rate of recidivism. And the more barriers that we can reduce that, that prevent people from having successful reentry experiences, the more impact we have on our overall system. So again, I want to thank you for your, your legislation. I want to thank the chairman for holding this hearing and my commendations to not only Mr. Lappin, but I see there are other members of the panel that we've had before us, and I want to commend you for the work that you're doing, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Bill Bray, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I ask for unanimous consent to introduce it into the record my written statement. Without objection. So ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate being here. <clears throat> And, Mr. Chairman, you know, we, uh, we sometimes talk about the unique opportunity we have with our representative form of government, and I think we grossly underestimate how much of a contribution our diverse backgrounds in Congress and any type of representative government brings to it, not just situations of our past professional experience. I mean, I operated a detention facility for a, a county of three million people. A uh, lot of experience there. Um, the, um, the flip side was my staff, uh, when I was chairman of the county, always pointed out that every time I visited the detention facilities, I knew half the people running the place and half of them that were in there. But coming from a working class background, it does bring experience that a lot of our um, more affluent um, uh, friends may not get, um, have not learned. And um, when I look at this item, it really strikes home in a lot of ways. And Mr. Chairman, I have to apologize. I just came back from my 40th reunion, high school reunion, and going through the years of watching my colleagues that I went to school with and how they went into the criminal justice system and how many uh, got in trouble right out of school, if not even while they were in school. And frankly, I got to tell you, over the years, I was very pessimistic about the entire concept that once you're in the system, can you ever get out? But I'd just like to add an optimistic note here. Uh, we're ripe old age, ready to face 60 years old, and watching my colleagues who uh, were in and out of the system for years. I'm very impressed 
with how many people um, that I thought would never get out of the system are successful, independent, family-based. Uh, um, and so I am much more optimistic at this age than I was at a younger age. Um, I guess as Bob Dylan once said, uh, um, that was so much longer ago, I was so much older then. And uh, I have to say that I, I hope we, especially those of us who um, have uh, been challenged, but but um, uh, gifted with the tougher times in our neighborhoods than some people have, that we try to take that experience and be practical about it. And I think the, f the biggest thing comes out is the ability to separate yourself from those elements in your um, in your past that have helped uh, lead you astray, but also that economic independence that a good job, uh, a feeling of success and economic opportunity uh, brings. And hopefully working at helping people out of the, um, the spiraling uh, problem of always being pulled back into the same um, negative components of our community and moving towards a positive. Because I just tell you, there's more individuals I see that I thought would never get out of an institution who are actually um, educating, coaching, involved. Um, some of them are very successful, even though they were during these tough times of unemployment, helping friends that have never known unemployment actually know how to uh, handle it. So I think that hopefully we'll be able to learn from the panel today about how D.C. is addressing this issue, how the nation's capital, um, with all its great challenges, is addressing this, especially when it comes to uh, a population that we ignore for too much, and that is that, that um, uh, you know, girls and ladies and, and women get, are in the system too, but they do not get the attention that we give, we give them, um, the male counterparts, and hopefully this hearing will help us to avoid that problem in the future. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I also want to thank the members of the panel for coming before this committee and helping us with our work. It is the custom of this committee uh, to ask all witnesses who are to offer testimony to be sworn. May I ask you to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to this subcommittee is the truth, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the uh, record show that all of the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. I'm going to actually read a brief introduction of each of our witnesses. Mr. Harley Lappin has served as director for the Federal Bureau of Prisons since April 4, 2003. A career public administrator in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, Mr. Lappin is responsible for the oversight and management of the Bureau's 115 institutions and for the safety and security of more than 210,000 inmates under the agency's jurisdiction. Ms. Adrian Potit serves as the agency head of the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency, CSOSA, for the District of Columbia. In this position, Ms. Poteet oversees a federal agency of nearly 1,300 employees, which was created by the D.C. Revitalization Act of 1997 to improve public safety through active community monitoring and supervision of ex-offenders. Ms. Nancy Levine is the current director of the Justice Policy Center at the Urban Institute. Ms. Levine is an expert on crime prevention and prisoner reentry and is the founding director of the U.S. Department of Justice's Mapping and Analysis for Public Safety program. Ms. Ashley McSwain is currently the Executive Director of Our Place, D.C. She holds a Master of Social Work from Temple University and a Master of Organizational Development from American University National Training Laboratories program. She has worked in the human services field for over 20 years. Ms. Zandanoni Day is an ex-offender and has served her time fully she is currently employed by Liberty Tax Service, located in Temple Hills, Maryland. Liberty Tax Service is an income tax prep service with multiple locations throughout the state of Maryland. Ms. Juanita Bennett is an ex-offender. She is currently under supervised release and is unemployed. She has served her time fully and is currently volunteering at Our Place, D.C. Our Place is considering her for employment. I welcome all. And to some, Mr. Lappin, Ms. Poteet, Ms. Levine, you're welcome back. I think you've uh, testified at least a couple of times before this committee, and, and we appreciate your, your involvement. Uh, now we're going to have opening statements from the panel. Uh, to begin, Mr. Lappin, you're now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. 
Good morning, Chairman Lynch and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you to discuss programming and reentry for female D.C. offenders in the custody of the Bureau of Prisons. Before I get into my comments, let me just thank all of you. Um, there's nothing prison administrators like more than people like you in leadership positions taking such an interest in reentry. And believe you me, it's long overdue. And it was about five or six years ago that many of you took such an interest. And believe you me, we're feeling the impact because at the end of the day, as we release 42,000 inmates a year back into our communities, there's nothing that satisfies us more than to see fewer of them coming back to prison, living normal lives, taking care of their family, have a job, and pay taxes just like the rest of us. So again, we pre appreciate uh, your support of this important uh, I issue. The Bureau of Prisons is responsible for the incarceration of almost 14,000 female offenders. Approximately 220 of these are, DC, are female DC code offenders, while the number of female D.C. code offenders is quite small compared to our entire population, we remain mindful of our unique role in the District of Columbia, and we devote substantial resources to meet the needs of these offenders. Female offenders, as you referenced, Mr. Chairman, present different challenges than their male counterparts. They have higher rates of mental disorders and higher rates of drug and alcohol use. Histories of physical and sexual abuse and trauma are quite prevalent. Finally, female offenders are often single parents in such cases, their incarceration means that their minor children are left to be raised by extended family members or foster families. Those caring for the children may lack the resources or ability to visit the incarcerated mother on a regular basis. We have 28 facilities that house female offenders. Of these, eight are Bureau of Prisons facilities that house D.C. female offenders. We also house D.C. female offenders in the D.C. jail, Fairview Residential Reentry Center, and the Maryland Department of Corrections. Crowding in the federal prisons across the country have had a profound impact on our inmate designation process. We have experienced significant increases in inmate population over the last two decades. The Bureau of Prisons is currently operating 37% overrated capacity system-wide, with our secure female facilities operating at 52% over capacity. We remain committed to the goal of housing the majority of the fe uh, female D.C. code offenders within 500 miles of the district we've been quite successful in meeting this goal. Currently, almost 82% of the female D.C. code offenders are confined in institutions within 250 miles of the district, primarily at FDC Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the secure female facility in Hazleton, West Virginia, the federal prison camp in Alderson, West Virginia, the federal correctional institution in Danbury, Connecticut. Inmates with significant medical needs requiring hospitalization are housed at our only federal medical center for females in Carswell, Texas. While this facility provides state-of-the-art care for our seriously ill female offenders, it is over 1,200 miles from the District of Columbia. We offer many programs for our female offenders, including prison industries and other uh, institution jobs, education, vocational training, substance abuse treatment, observance of faith and religion, psychological services, counseling, release preparation, and other programs that impact essential life skills. We also provide structured activities designed to teach inmates productive ways to use their time. Regarding specific female offender needs, we have enhanced staffing of our psychology services programs at our female institutions to meet the increased needs of the mental health services for female offenders. At 11 Bureau of Prisons facilities, we offer the Resolve Program, a cognitive behavior workshop and treatment program to address trauma-related mental health needs for female offenders. Our mothers and infants Nurturing Program, uh, Together Program is a res residential program for pregnant females that provides parenting skills and prenatal care, followed by a bonding period for the mother and infant. The program is available at seven sites, including West Virginia and Connecticut. Mindful of our role as the State Department of Corrections uh, for the district, we emphasize specialized programming and opportunities for DC offenders that will help facilitate their successful reentry. In addition to our ongoing reentry programming, we have engaged in a fruitful partnership with Our Place DC to assist female DC offenders to successfully transition back to the district. Our Place collaborates with BOP at FDC Philadelphia, the F female facility in Hazleton, and the Fairview Residential Reentry Center, where our female DC co defenders transition through the Residential Reentry Center program. And finally, we continue to collaborate with court services and offender service uh, su supervision agency on transitional issues. Chairman Lynch, again, it's my pleasure to be here. Look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Lappin. Uh, 
Before we continue with the testimony, I've just been called to a second hearing uh, on financial services where I have an amendment pending. So uh, in my absence, uh, uh, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton will, will preside. Uh, she's been intimately involved with this and will probably do a much better job than I would have anyway. But uh, Ms. Poteet, you're now uh, welcome uh, to take five minutes for an opening statement. Chairman Lynch, ranking members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss the court services and offender supervision agency's role in facilitating the successful reentry and community reintegration of the District of Columbia women returning home from prison. On any given day, CISOSA supervises 16,000 offenders, of which 15 percent, or approximately 2,400, are female. Of those women, nearly 500 returned to the community after serving a period of incarceration. The remaining 1,900 are probationers. Between 2006 and 2009, CISOSA experienced an 18 percent increase in the number of women with post-release supervision obligations over the same period, the number of with post-release obligations increased by just 7 percent. Of the 2,324 D.C. Code felons who returned home from prison in 2009, 222 or 9.5 percent were women. The challenges faced by women on community supervision are often exacerbated by a history of physical, sexual and mental abuse. Approximately 32 percent report having been victimized as a child, 25 percent report victimization as an adult, nearly 8 percent report having either lived on the streets, in a shelter, or in transitional living facility during the most recent six-month period, and about 30 percent report having a current housing arrangement that is considered unstable or temporary. Additionally, 45 percent do not have a diploma or GED, more than 70 percent are unemployed on any given day, and more than 40 percent have a dependent child. Nearly half of the women report having been diagnosed with and or treated for a mental health disorder and 82 percent self-report illicit drug use. CISOSA supervision and treatment interventions are employed based on a proven best practice and on the unique needs of the individual offender. All CISOSA offenders undergo an extensive screening to identify their risk profile and their specific needs. Offenders are assigned to special mental health, domestic violence, sex offender, high-risk substance abuse, or traffic alcohol teams as appropriate. Our offenders receive a continuum of substance abuse treatment from detox to residential treatment as well as a wide range of other support services. Our gender-specific programming and our plans for the entry and sanction center will be addressed later in my testimony. CISOSA also works closely with the Department of Corrections Residential Substance Abuse Treatment Program, RSAT. We began this effort in October 2009, targeting 18 female offenders in their initial 90-day assessment and treatment readiness program at the Correctional Treatment Facility. We monitor RSAT female offenders' progress in the prescribed community-based treatment modality and provide additional treatment and sanctions interventions to support availability upon DLC resources. Last year, we partnered with Our Place, D.C., on a reentry demonstration project to provide comprehensive pre-release planning to women returning to the District of Columbia. To date, 16 women from Hazleton, and 26 women from FDC Philadelphia who are going to be under CISOSA supervision have expressed an interest in participating in this program. On June 28th, we conducted our first video conference with Hazleton. In August, we will have a video conference with Philadelphia and follow up with Hazleton. In this fall, in response to the growing population of females with co-occurring substance abuse and mental health issues, we expect to a plan to expand the scope of our women's programming with four major initiatives. The first, will we, we will be opening a one 15-bed floor on the reentry and sanction center for female offenders. The RSC provides high-risk offenders with a comprehensive clinical assessment and treatment readiness program. At capacity, the RSC can serve up to 180 women per year. Women will complete the 28-day program and have an individualized long-term treatment plan that they can agree to complete. 
Many of the women will report to the RSC immediately following their release from prison. In addition, women who begin testing positive for drugs and who meet the program's eligibility criteria may be assigned to the RSC as a supervision sanction. The second initiative will be the reorganization of our mental health branch to establish two women-only supervision teams. As our third initiative, we will launch Day Reporting Center exclusively for women. The Women's Day Reporting Center will provide a productive alternative to idle time for our unemployed female offenders. And finally, we are expanding our Women in Control, a WICA program for women suffering from substance abuse and mental illness. This psychoeducational and therapeutic program thus far has served 91 women in fiscal year 2009. The expanded program will target high-risk female offenders who have at least six months remaining under supervision and who are at risk for violent weapons, sex, or drug charges. We are excited about the potential of these four initiatives to improve the reentry experience and support the successful supervision of our female population. This concludes my testimony. I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today and prepare to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Ms. Poteet. Uh, the next witness is um, uh, Nancy Levine uh, uh, of the um, Justice Policy Center at the Urban Institute. Thank you, Representative Norton. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today about the incarceration and release of female DC code felons. As you know, the Urban Institute has conducted extensive research on the topic of prisoner reentry. And perhaps our, our largest study is called Returning Home, Understanding the Challenges of Prisoner Reentry. It's a longitudinal study of prisoner reentry and includes both men and women who are navigating the challenges of returning to their homes and communities. And for that reason, we're able to discuss in detail uh, the differences in experiences between men and women who are reentering society. So what do we know about women reentering society? Well, each woman's story is unique. Uh, the broad brushstrokes, however, are quite similar in that women are typically incarcerated for property or drug possession offenses, and they're likely to have long-term substance abuse histories. In Maryland, in fact, half of the women we interviewed reported daily heroin use in the six months leading up to their most recent incarceration. This compared to about a third of the men we interviewed. In terms of supporting themselves financially, Women are much less likely to have been legally employed prior to their incarceration. They're less likely to receive job training or have gained vocational skills while behind bars. Mm -hmm. And they're less likely to participate in job placement services and ultimately to be legally employed after their release. This employment hurdle may explain by women exiting prison report more difficulties meeting their day-to-day -day financial needs are almost twice as likely to report earning income through illegal means and are much more likely to rely on public assistance as a source of income than are men. And even among women who are able to find jobs, they earn on average $1.50 less per hour than their employed male counterparts. Lack of employment opportunities may also explain why women are more likely to report difficulties in paying for housing. These difficulties lead to higher rates of residential mobility, with women more likely than men to have lived in more than one place since their release. And they're also more likely to report difficulty in finding housing due to their criminal records. The unique obstacles that women face during their reintegration contribute to their subsequent criminal behavior. In the study we did in Texas, we found that women were almost twice as likely as men to be back behind bars in a year's time. Now, the data I've presented so far paints a pretty grim picture for women's prospects of successful reintegration and rehabilitation. But while the challenges are great, the opportunities exist that are often overlooked for this population, and chief among those is the important role that family support can play in successful reentry. Our reentry studies have found that families can favorably influence the reentry process, with higher levels of family support linked to higher employment rates and reduced recidivism following release. Fortunately, women report roughly the same degree of family support as men although they more, are more likely to rely on children as that source of support uh, than are men who typically rely on mothers, aunts, grandmothers, and so forth. 
Indeed, incarcerations, uh, incarcerated women's relationships with their children represent the single greatest difference between them and their male counterparts. When we interviewed men and women behind bars prior to the release, we asked an open-ended question. We said, what are you most looking for, forward to after your release? And the differences uh, between male and female respondents were pretty stunning. Uh, what men said, the top answer was tied between calling my own shots and pizza. And I'm not kidding. While the overwhelming majority of women responded, reuniting with my children. Clearly, women's ties to their children can serve as an incentive to refrain from substance abuse and criminal behavior. But these ties to their children and their support from family um, are closely linked to the type of contact they have behind bars. Uh, Representative Norton, as you correctly noted in your opening remarks, there's no definitive research that links uh, distance from prison to recidivism, but there is research that links contact with family members behind bars to re uh, reintegration outcomes. Okay, so the, the question here is, are incarcerated DC female felons able to have contact with their family members? And I was encouraged to hear that the numbers of women who are uh, incarcerated close to DC has increased over time, and yet it sounds like as many as one in five are still incarcerated as far away as Texas. It stands to reason that the farther away these prisoners are housed from their homes, the less contact they will have with family. I therefore encourage members of the subcommittee to continue your efforts to ensure that female DC code violators are housed in prisons close to their homes. Doing so will enhance the ability of incarcerated mothers to maintain contact with their children, with re which research indicates is a critical factor in successful reintegration. Doing so will also aid women in connecting to the community-based substance abuse treatment and mental health services that they so critically need to successfully reintegrate. In the meantime, efforts to connect prisoners to post-release service providers through video conferencing should be supported and expanded to include communications with family members. Thank you for your time. I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Ms. Levine. Uh, we'll next hear from Ashley McSwain, who is the Executive Director of Our Place uh, here in DC. Ms. McSwain. And members of the subcommittee, I'm honored by this invitation to appear before Please you. Please move the microphone closer. Move it closer. If it's on, is it on? I hope mm -hmm. it is. <laughs> I'm honored by this invitation to appear before you to discuss the issues facing female offenders as they transition back into the DC community after incarceration. I'd like to begin with a story about one of our clients. After almost one year in custody, one of our female clients, let's call her Hope, heard an Our Place presentation in the Federal Detention Center in Philadelphia. Upon her release, she visited Our Place and found guidance, support, and friendship void of the judgment she expected. She got a resume, an email address, clothes, and suits for interviewing and legal advice to get her driver's license reinstated, which had been suspended while she was in custody because she was not notified of the hearing. Hope now works for our place and serves in a vital role and feels that her dignity and self-esteem has been restored. Our clients represent the breadth of challenges that women face as they re-enter society from prison. They have a host of unique medical, psychological, and financial problems and needs that distinguish them from male offenders. And while male offenders experience some of the same problems, several factors set the, se uh, set the needs of female offenders apart. Many have histories of substance and sexual abuse, and over half have been victims of domestic violence. This all creates a unique challenge for the female offender. When a woman is sent to prison, the entire family structure is impacted differently than when a man is sent. It is said that when a man goes to prison, he loses his freedom, but when a woman goes to prison, she loses her children. While women are incarcerated, their families suffer, children are sent to live with relatives or friends or placed in foster homes, sometimes separated from their siblings. Additionally, because DC code felons are forced to serve their sentences far away from home, family units and the female offender is further burdened. Many of the women we serve tell us that our place is the only connection they have to the DC community since their family members do not have the funds or the transportation to visit them while in custody. 
Our place began offering services in 1999 upon hearing women's stories of incarceration and their struggles to reestablish themselves in the community upon their release. Since opening its doors, our place has served over 7,000 D.C. women. But over the last two years, we have seen a 30 percent increase in females that visit our programs for services. Currently, an average of 90 women walk into the doors every single week. 66 percent of our staff has been formally incarcerated, which brings a perspective that keeps us informed of the needs and experiences of the women we serve. The success stories of our staff members become a testament to what is possible for our clients. Our primary service is the drop-in center where women can visit us directly from prison to begin to gain direction for their next steps after their release. We provide funding for birth certificates, police clearances, tokens, and identification. We also have a clothing boutique, drinks and snacks, computer, faxes, copy machines, and other administrative supports. Our services also include a legal education and support, including direct representation, employment and education, HIV AIDS prevention, and on-site testing, condom distribution. Our case managers sit in on team meetings with the Bureau of Prisons, the female inpate, and various BOP staff. This is unprecedented and further allows us to fully understand what the offender will need when she's released upon her, upon her release. She, we also recently began video conferencing with women in custody in collaboration with CSOSA. We offer transitional housing for women living with AIDS. We work closely with the local jail and a variety of federal prisons, specifically Hazleton, FDC, Philadelphia, and Alderson. We run a family transportation program to take family members to Danbury and Hazleton each and every month so that children and loved ones can visit their family members. We offer a scholarship program that helps women pay for their training while in custody and after their release. This program is also extended to their um, to their children, and we also accept collect calls from the women or, who are in custody. A felony conviction comes with shame and stigma that can be difficult to manage alone. Offering a comprehensive team of wraparound support can be the difference between success and reoffending. At our place, we create a sense of community and connectedness. Additionally, the sheer volume of relationships that female offenders need to maintain can overwhelm women, marking the beginning of their path to recidivism. For example, most women must work with a drug treatment counselor, attend NA or AA meetings, work with a mental health counselor, medical doctor, family counselor, probation officer, housing counselor, welfare counselor, employment counselor, academic instructor, children, family members, husbands, boyfriends, and many more all at the same time. We help the women put their obligations and needs into perspective. We are fortunate that our place has granted unprecedented access to the women while inside the prisons so that when they return home, they will have a plan that can be implemented as they relearn the community they have been away for sometimes for decades. We are sincerely grateful to the Bureau of Prisons and our many other partners for their commitment to assisting these women during their transition home. The work being conducted at our place offers a unique opportunity to develop a model of service delivery for female offenders all over the country. Every woman being released from prison needs support as she re-enters the community. They are great organizations doing effective work, yet they struggle every single month to make payroll to support their efforts. Given adequate funding can impact the needs of many more individuals who sincerely want to make change within their lives. Today, Hope is building a stable future for herself and her family and serves as a role model for many women who enter the doors of our place. She is lighting the torch for all women who come behind her. Let us give every D.C. woman the same support and opportunity that Hope had. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share our story. Thank you very much, Ms. McSwain. The uh, next uh, witness is uh, Zand 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 Zandanoni Day. Uh, Miss Day, glad to receive your testimony. Good morning, uh, Chairman Norton. Um, I'm really, really nervous. I was I was okay until uh, Miss <laughs> Tyndall called me yesterday. But um, anyway, my name well, is Zandanoni. You need Day. have no reason to be nervous. We I, are I am. Um, but is your microphone on? Really, really bad. <laughs> 
<laughs> My name is Zandanoni Day. I am a uh, 47 year old mother of three adult children who, was, who had been a convicted felon since 1986. Um, and these uh, challenges and obstacles I've been facing for years, I'm just one of those kind of people that uh, like to put people to the test. If you tell me you're gonna do something, then I wanna know that you're gonna do it. Um, my last uh, conviction was August of 2007. I was convicted of distribution of cocaine. I was housed at uh, SFF Hazleton from April the 21st of 2008, where I was released, thank you, um, in June, where I entered the halfway house, Fairview halfway house from June the 30th to September the 15th of 2009. Um, I have employable skills. Unfortunately, my CDL expired while I was incarcerated and I didn't have the funds to get one. So I requested that the halfway house give me a referral to DC Our Place. Our Place came to uh, Hazleton very, very often. Um, and it made, um, I don't know, I just wanted to, I actually just wanted to put them to the test, uh, you know, for real. Um, being incarcerated was really, really stressful for me. My mom is disabled. Um, I got a daughter that's in the Air Force and I have two sons and nobody had transportation to come see me. Well, our place made that less stressful because they provided transportation. So I was able to see my family. Um, I was glad to be close to home, opposed to, opposed to being sent far away. So um, our place helped me, even though my children are grown, please don't think that we don't go through the reunification process because we do. You know, we, we fight harder to be reuni reunified with our kids uh, because they can make their own decisions, because they um, can choose whether they want to deal with us or not. And my kids were, were willing to do whatever it took to get back in with me. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> you, can. you still can't hear me? If, if you have to move it closer to you, because we really do want to hear what you have to say. Okay. <laughs> That's okay, good. Can you hear me now? That's good. Okay. Um, our place helped me with the reunification process. Uh, even though my kids are grown, um, it was harder to uni reunify with them than it is to reunify with smaller kids um, because they could make their own decisions, because they could decide whether they wanted to deal with me or not. Um, I went through a whole lot of ups and downs, um, didn't know what I wanted to do, and our place provided that support for me. Um, after being released from Fairview, uh, I, went to, I went to a training program because I needed to get skills that I could uh, be, uh, get employment back into the uh, administrative field. I needed to go through a training program. I went to our place and I got my resume done and I sat with the employment counselor and they helped me find a training program. They helped me with uh, clothing and getting uh, identification.